And this one was much sharper, like a very sharp sense of regret of like, wow, I lived in this body that worked perfectly in every single way for 20 years and I never stopped to think, oh my gosh, like how lucky am I? How lucky am I that I could have done anything I wanted, walked, run, jumped, done all of these things without a second thought. And even though I was a very fit and active person, I never was was thankful for that. I just assumed, I just assumed that that's how it would always be. I didn't know that it was a privilege. Hello, beautiful people. On today's podcast, we have Emma Carey. Nine years ago, Emma was skydiving over the Swiss Alps when her instructor's parachute failed to open properly, falling 15,000 feet it's around 4.5 kilometers to the ground. Emma incredibly survived, but was paralyzed from the waist down and told she would never walk again. In her new book, The Girl Who Fell From The Sky, she shares her story of courage, resilience, hope, and her journey of coming to walk again. What I love about this conversation is Emma's beautiful spirit, showing the evolution of her inner strength. Emma shares she wasn't always the positively oriented person, living, as we do, in the ebb and flow of life. It wasn't until her accident that she came to truly understand her relationship with her body and the appreciation of it. We explore the idea that as much as society focuses on the way that we should look, we are indeed not our body, and that our essence appears to be closer to the truth. She interestingly shares how being in a wheelchair influenced her to deeply want to walk again. And as she powerfully began to walk, thoughts arise that now she wants to run. It gives this beautiful insight into the human condition as how we generally are always focused on more, which to an extent can be great in terms of working towards expanding one's potential, but we certainly also have to be accountable to when we continue to move the goalposts and do not appreciate what we have right now. Please enjoy this conversation with Emma. Welcome to To Be Human. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks for having me. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) So Emma, where I'd love to start is I want to talk to you about fear. There was a beautiful sort of juxtaposition that you shared in your beautiful new book about how before your accident, you kind of visualized life as being too short. And then post-accident, there was sort of this moment in time where you felt like life was going to feel far too long. Mm -hmm. Can you begin by sort of sharing with us more about that Emma that was sort of in that fear of feeling that life was going to be too short? Yeah, so I mainly was referring to the me that I was in the two minutes that I was falling to the ground Mm. thinking that I only had you know 10 seconds left to live and I was only 20 years old so that's when I had the feeling of like oh there's still so many things I want to do and I've run out of time like life is far too short and then when I when I landed on the ground and I didn't die and I realized I was paralyzed that's when I and obviously I don't feel this way anymore, but when I had no, you know, no idea of where life was going to go from then, that's when I thought life now seems far, far too long. Like I don't yeah. know how I'm going to get through this hour, let alone the rest of my life feeling this way. Um, and then I think later on in the book, I say when life feels like it's too short again, just because I'm now loving <laughs> yeah. life so much that I just, you know, I... I don't want it to ever end. So it's, you know, a bit of a roller coaster with those emotions. <laughs> but but yeah, it was such a um such a what's the word? A paradox, juxtaposition for from, you know, one minute before I landed to one minute after I landed of just how differently I viewed life. Yeah. And in those really intense sort of like quote unquote life and death experiences, it's so common for for people to sort of experience like certain faces popping up or certain memories popping up Mm -hmm. in, in that fall, which I'm sure in the moment felt really long and really quick all at the same time. Yeah. What was sort of popping up for you that you sort of thought, Oh, I wish that I had more time to do this. Or maybe I wish that I'd said something that I hadn't said. Yeah. Well, I mainly just remember feeling like a deep sense of regret for not doing not doing much. And I don't mean anything specific. It wasn't like, oh, I wish I spoke to that person or I wish I did this 
job or visited this country. It wasn't specific things. It was just like I I knew that I wasn't living my life to the full and I was just taking mm. each day for granted. And I was just, um, and again, I know I was only 20, so maybe I would have, you know, had this progression in life anyway. But <laughs> back then I just, I just was, you know, just taking everything for granted and not realizing what a privilege it is to be alive to be alive so the main feeling I felt was just a deep regret and a feeling of like what a shame that I'm only realizing how much I want to live now that it's too late and when you sort of came down to the ground and realized that you were sort of not experiencing feeling or movement Mm -hmm. in places that you normally would feel you sort of speak about how time froze for you and your soul dropped and for me in your book this was like a really big moment because you could feel like just that description of your soul dropping. It's become such a very real moment for you. What was that like to have that experience? Yeah, it's such a, I found that part, I always had the, like the line, my soul dropped because that's the only way I knew how to describe it. It's not just like my heart dropped. It was just everything in me was just in a single instant. Yeah. It gives me goosebumps even talking about it. (laughs) But it's such a hard moment to describe because, you know, how do you go from being a 20 year old carefree traveling the world thinking, you, I'm about to skydive to (laughs) a few minutes later being paralyzed on the ground with what I thought was a dead person on my back who thankfully he survived. But it's like, yeah, how do you go from that life to that life in just two minutes and wrap your head around that quickly so it just yeah I find it really really hard to describe but it was like again a sense of and this one was much sharper like a very sharp sense of regret of like wow I lived in this body that worked perfectly in every single way for 20 years and I never stopped to think oh my gosh like how lucky am I how lucky am I that I could have done anything I wanted walked run jumped done all of these things without a second thought and even though I was a very fit and active person, I never was was thankful for that. I just assumed, I just assumed that that's how it would always be. I didn't know that it was a privilege. So it was just, yeah, a very sharp sense of regret and also confusion because, you know, you can move something like, yeah, think of just moving your arm right now. You just tell it to do it. You don't, you don't even think about it. You just do it. And then, so I, that's how I'd always been with my legs. And then suddenly for it to not respond in the way you're used to was just so confusing because it was so quick yeah yeah and when you came when you went into hospital you were told by doctors that your injuries were going to be permanent that Mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to walk Mm -hmm. in knowing what you know now what is your perspective on doctors specialists experts telling people that this is permanent and that they won't be able to walk? How much do you feel like that affects some people's capacity to really try um, and sort of, I guess, potentially create a different outcome to what they're sort of told by by these experts? Mm. Yeah, I I mean, I can see it from both sides. On one hand, I I understand why they need to be so honest to give people a realistic, you know, view of what it is in the same way that, like, aren't there studies that, um, I don't, and I don't know the studies, so I could be fully wrong, but I've, I've read books about how if someone's given a diagnosis and they're given a, you know, a timeline, sometimes they will, like, they will die on that exact timeline that right. they're given. I think it's called, you know like, I mean? pointing the bone or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it's like, okay, I think, I think that there could be a way where we're given this news without it being so, uh, so certain. Because, you know, on one hand, on one hand, I fully understand why they need to do it. But on the other hand, I think, yeah, if you're told something by, by a doctor who, of course, you're going to trust and believe and, you know, they're just saying what they know in facts, you, yeah, you, you believe it. And so you might not give yourself any other option. You might not, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. I feel two ways about it. But I think, I think that there definitely could be a lot more empathy involved with the way right. that the news is delivered sometimes. <laughs> yes, I could definitely pick yeah. that up in the book. <laughs> Just since I've had so many amazing doctors and surgeons who are like so kind and compassionate, but definitely mm-hmm. some people can be quite um, abrupt. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when hearing something like that, 
I mean, we're taking you back to obviously this time in your life when everything was changing so quickly. So obviously you're in a different headspace to what you are now. When they tell you that something like that is permanent, sort of in your lack of experience and being in such a big situation, did you just sort of accept that 100% as truth or was there a part of you that kind of was open to the idea that maybe things could be different? Um, I, I mean, I fully heard what they were saying and I was very scared, but at the same time, I didn't really believe it. And not in the sense that like, I thought, oh no, I'm going to be the one to prove them wrong or I, I can do it. Not at, not at all like that. I think I was honestly just in denial because <laughs> again, it was just something that so happened big, so quickly. Yeah. So I was like, of course, like, of course I'll walk again. Like it just, wow. it still was so, it still was so, um, natural to me because you know a few days early I was doing that no worries so I didn't yeah I don't think I ever 100% believed it but definitely not in yeah not in like a strong self-belief way just, right. <laughs> just I was shocked yeah and in terms of being in hospital um you went through a pretty dark period there for a moment and you were having sort of thoughts of wanting to die I mean you got put on suicide watch what was sort of that moment in time like for you, as you suggest, is it, was a lot of it sort of just got to do with the fact that everything just happened so quickly, your life changed just so quickly that it was almost you playing catch up with what circumstances you'd had experienced? Yeah, I think so. And also before, before this happened, I, I just wasn't, a, I wasn't a positive person at all and I wasn't a mentally strong person. So there was no you know, I had no history in my own life to, to prove to myself that I'm capable of getting through hard things. Right. So I just thought, you know, this, you know, if this happened to someone else, I'm sure they'd be able to, they'd be able to get through it and come out the other side better than ever. But I just, there was no part of me that saw that for myself. So I just thought, um, I thought that going through something like this would mean that I would never be able to be happy again. And that's what made right. me really scared. Not so much not being able to walk again. I was I kind of came to terms with that pretty quickly, but not being able to feel joy again really scared me. So that's why I kept thinking, you know, I would rather just not not go through with it at all. And what was the switch for you? When did you kind of come to realize that maybe there was a possibility of your experience happiness again? Uh, I think there was like a real epiphany I had in hospital where I just woke up one morning and was like, I don't, and I don't know why this happened, but I just woke up <laughs> and was like, look, this accident's happened. Um, whether I like it or not, there's nothing I can do to take it back. So, you know, I can be paralyzed, but my mental attitude can go either way. I can be negative about it for the rest of my life, or I can just try and get on with life and see what happens. But even before that moment, there were moments even from, you know, an hour after I landed on the ground where I would find myself smiling or laughing at something, even though I was in the absolute worst moment of my life and feeling wow. completely distressed. And I had never, I never knew that was possible to, you know, laugh when you feel like your world is ending. And so there were so many, there were so many little points like that, that just over time proved to me that like, oh, it is possible to still find joy even if everything on paper isn't, you know, going going well at all, even if you're laying with blood covered in your face in a field, like it's still possible. And that really, really surprised me, but was such a beautiful lesson to learn. Yeah. And what role do you think having sort of this profound acceptance has been in your life? How has it kind of helped you move forward in this journey? Um, I think I just, I... Uh, there was another moment in hospital where I really um, wanted to put the focus, and you would have read about it in the book, put the focus on my mental and emotional health rather than just my physical health, which was a moment when someone who'd been living in a wheelchair for, I think, two years at that stage, he, we were just talking and he said to me in conversation, you know, I'll never be happy unless I can walk again. Mm -hmm. And I think I'd subconsciously been been thinking that as well without you know saying it that bluntly but when I heard it worded like that I just thought oh my god what a risk like imagine you know putting all of my future joy and happiness on this one very specific thing that I probably mm. won't get and so from that point I kind of 
it made it easier for me to accept what had happened and move forward with my life because I wanted to make sure that I was okay whether or not I got better. So I think that really helped moving the focus away from my physical recovery, which was something very much out of my control and putting it on something I could control, which was my mental health. This is one of my favorite parts of your story because I this is absolutely relevant to everyone is sort of your your journey, your experience of coming to understand, like you said, you share in the book, you never thought of your body as separate to yourself and you always assumed that it was who you are and mm-hmm. that is what defined you. Can you share more about that? Because I think that's one of the biggest lessons I took away from your story is, is that lesson that you are not just your body, that you are separate to your essence, your, your being of who you are is separate to something that I feel like we certainly overindulge with and, and certainly can develop a better relationship with. Yeah, absolutely. So there were so many, so many parts to this. And the first, the first, I guess, realization came when I was laying there on the ground and I was paralyzed and I had that deep feeling of regret for not using my body. And I thought, how could I have ever just viewed my body as this object, like as this aesthetic object that I just, you know, cared solely about what it looked like. I didn't want to have big muscles or I didn't want to get chubby or like all these things. When laying there on the ground, I would have done anything to be in any body that just enabled me to move and run around and, you know, get up (laughs) from that moment in time. And so that, that made me view my body in a completely different way. But then even beyond that, when I was it living in the spinal ward, the spinal ward was filled with, um, you know, filled with people who we were all living in wheelchairs. Uh, some of us could, couldn't move from the waist down, but a lot of people couldn't move anything besides their head and couldn't feel anything. So if you were to, you know, to touch someone, you would, uh, you would need to touch their face for them to be able to feel that touch. Mm-hmm. And it just, met, and all these people were the most like remarkable, hilarious, just beautiful people I'd ever met. And it just made me realize, and now it seems obvious, but I'd never thought about it before, that just we're not, you know, if if someone who can't feel 90% of their body or move 90% of their body is still very much, obviously, but very much a whole vibrant person, why are we placing so much focus on our body when it's actually not who we are? at all and not just you know not only not what we look like matters but also what we what our body can do isn't what's relevant either like you know we the things that we love about people aren't you know what we can see or what they can do for us it's the way they make us feel and that we have regardless of our body I don't know if I explained that very well (laughs) it's it's absolutely beautiful I really honestly Emma I really love this and Do you think that you experience, because what comes to mind when I sort of play into this beautiful perspective is a deeper sense of freedom in my life. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's something that you've experienced being able to sort of gain this perspective? Yeah, definitely. I I mean, I very much... um, don't focus on a lot of things that I used to, used to focus on. And again, mm-hmm. that was probably a natural progression that would have happened in my life going through my twenties. Yeah. But I just, yeah, used to put so much focus and like, um, you know, my mood would really depend on how I felt about my body where it's like, I could quite literally go days without looking in the mirror. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, and I just, I just don't think to, you know, like it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> To me anymore mm. and like obviously there's nothing wrong with taking pride in your appearance I don't mean that at all it's more just like it doesn't affect how I feel about myself which is very freeing because you realize you have so much more to offer to the world and so you go from being in a wheelchair to beginning to walk mm-hmm. what are those sort of first few steps like for you Yeah, it's weird. Like, obviously, so overwhelmingly uh, I was so happy and so excited and so uh, proud of myself and it was also so bloody hard like I was just puffing and yeah. sweating and <laughs> but, at the, but, at, but at the same time it felt um, walking felt normal because that definitely didn't it felt so difficult but it felt like you know I was as I said I've been so used to walking for 20 years so it felt like of course I'm back on my feet I still I'd been in a walking for such a longer period of time than I'd been in a wheelchair so when I stood back up it was like it just felt um, it made sense yeah it just made sense whereas I guess if I'd been 
if I'd been paralyzed for 10 years and then it stood up, it might have, you know, I, I probably would have felt more shocked by that. But again, in my denial brain, I was like, of course I'm standing up. <laughs> I don't know, very hard to, hard to explain, but I was still very, you know, overjoyed and excited at the same time. Yeah, that made me think of a part of in your story where you were asked, I think it was in hospital and you sort of had to share that you were paraplegic and kind of that experience of having the words come out of your mouth. It just felt so foreign mm-hmm. for you. Yeah. It was like yeah. an interesting yeah, experience to have, I could imagine. Yeah, because I guess from I'd always just been told, you know, you've broken your back, you won't walk again, you can't feel your legs. And then when someone straight up asked me what my diagnosis was and I said the, the words, I'm a paraplegic, I just hadn't, I hadn't like thought about that before, even though the words came out of my head. I was like, oh, yeah, like that's right. And it felt so foreign and unnatural for me to say because I wasn't, I wasn't used to, you know, that identity yet. Yeah. But I, even as I was saying it, I knew that there would be words that I would, you know, that would become so familiar and common to my life, which is so weird. I imagine uh, it's kind of similar to if, you know, people get married and change their name. It would take so long to adjust to saying <laughs> yeah. that new, new name because you're so used to something else. Yeah. Yeah. And how does writing play into you healing? I find writing very cathartic because sometimes, um, you know, if I have no idea what I'm feeling specifically, if I'm just feeling a bit anxious or like frazzled in my brain and I start writing, then I very often like come to the root of the problem or like solve the problem just by, you know, getting it all out. So I've always loved writing. And I also love it because you can then go back and, you know, look back on the way you were feeling in a particular moment in time, which Mm. I'm very thankful I've done because I would, when I was writing the book, I was going back through, you know, years and years of Instagram captions where I've shared a lot of writing and I was like, thank God I wrote that down or I would have just completely forgot how I was feeling about that. So yeah, I've always loved writing for for that reason. Yeah, I loved a part that you shared uh, because you actually ended up getting a pretty big wound in your foot that sort of lasted for at least 12 months. And there was this sort of a letter that you write to yourself reminding yourself of how you're feeling and the perspective that you're having in these moments what is it like sort of reading back on that? Do you feel like it's been quite powerful to kind of like reconnect with those those moments in your life and kind of pull those lessons into the present? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think when you're going through a difficult thing, like for example, when I was in my wheelchair thinking I'd never walk again, you imagine that you're never ever going to take it for granted if you do walk again you think that's not humanly possible that I would ever forget this feeling and how lucky I am to be doing something but you do and that seems really weird and ungrateful to say but that's just life like we all take for granted for things that we never thought we would but you know we just we adapt and it becomes normal to us again and so writing that letter to myself, which I wrote at a time when I was back in my wheelchair for a year and I was going to doctors every day and it was just, it was a really difficult time in my life. When I read the letter, I can remember so vividly how I was feeling at that time and how I would have like punched future Emma in the face if I knew that she <laughs> had forgotten that feeling. Yeah. So it's it's just such a good, um, yeah, a good reminder to to, you know, be grateful for the things that we I'm sure if we, you know, stop to think to be grateful, we are, but in day-to-day life, it's easily forgotten. And so, yeah, it was an important lesson. (laughs) (laughs) And how has courage and resilience played a role in your experience? Yeah, so resilience is something I thought that people just either had or didn't have. And I thought I didn't have that (laughs) so that's why I was so you know so petrified going through a difficult time I was like I'm not I'm not the bounce back type um but it's something that is well I don't know if it's innate or it's something that's learned but it's something that we all have and that we can all um you know reach on when we need to and Mm -hmm. it that was a really important and special message for me to learn that you know it's and it's so cheesy because everyone says this all the time but like we don't know how strong we are until we have no choice but to be strong and I really mm-hmm. believe that is true like it's we're all capable of so much more than we think and so yeah resilience isn't something I I, I don't think anyone can or maybe people can teach it I don't know but I think it's something we all have inside us you know when we need it 
And your book is sort of surrounding this idea that through one of your greatest tragedies, you found your truest self. Who is your truest self? Mm. How would I describe? <laughs> I don't know. That's a tricky question. I guess it's, just- it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, because I, I get asked this as well. And I feel like it's almost an inner knowing that can't be articulated. Would that more resonate with you than to yeah. kind of describe it? Yeah. <laughs> or even even as we were saying before, like that sense of freedom that you yeah. feel when you you know you're you know you know you're surrounded by the people who uh, light you up. You're doing things that light you up. You're not going against your intuition. You're you know you, when you just feel like you're doing everything that your soul and your body and everything is telling you that is Beautiful. right for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love it. And I want to talk to you, I want to sort of come back to, excuse me, this idea of gratitude. Is this something, because as you sort of shared, it's like when you're in sort of your darkest moments, there really is these moments where it's like, oh, if I can kind of go back to who I was or the capabilities that I have, I would be so grateful. Mm -hmm. Do you try and pull gratitude into your life as a daily practice or is it something that you kind of sort of more tend to pull on in sort of I guess those darker moments I mean I think both like I used to when I in the first few years after my accident I would very like literally rapid list you know like the three things you're grateful for or I would like say right. things out loud and, and it would be a very like literal form of gratitude whereas I think and I still resort back to that if I'm if I feel myself having a low day then I'll deliberately do things like that whereas in regular day-to-day life, I think that you can feel gratitude without, you know, without needing to write it down or say it out loud. You just notice little things and think you just, you know, you have that feeling of like um, how lucky you are, how blessed you are, or just, you know, I, I, yeah. And so I think it can, oh, and I even wrote in the book that sometimes a different form of gratitude is when you, like, what did I say? Yeah. I've, when you're so you can do something so easily and so often that you forget to even be grateful for it Mm. like me with walking like obviously I'm so bloody grateful for walking obviously but some days I will forget that and I think how lucky am I to actually forget to say I'm grateful for walking because now I get to do it so often and maybe that sounds counterintuitive but it makes sense in my head (laughs) it absolutely makes sense it was a big lesson that I learned Uh, a few years ago I started doing ultra marathons and oh, I wow. remember, yeah, and I mean, they're challenging experiences. Um, and I remember like quite quickly getting frustrated that kind of like my body wasn't performing how I wanted it to perform. There was a sort of, you know, aches and pains in different parts of my body. And this beautiful girl that I met along this run that is now one of my best friends years later, uh, really sort of, she didn't do it uh, directly. It was very implicitly, but it was very powerful, <laughs> just sort of spoke to how you know be so grateful for your feet like they have carried you through decades of your life and be grateful for your legs and you know just this idea um as you're suggesting of just really connecting with your body and be grateful for the for what it is doing in your life is just such a such a powerful moment because any time that I find myself it's anchored now ungrateful for how I'm showing up in my body I just be grateful for, you know, whatever the capacity that I have in that moment. Yeah. Um, it's been quite transformational for sure. Yeah. yeah, it's a good perspective switch, hey. And yeah. well done on doing ultra marathons. That's yeah. <laughs> crazy. What an achievement. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's very fun. But, I, I mean, I guess that's why I like those things. And, you know, it doesn't have to be an ultra marathon, obviously, but just – I mean, it could be in your in your life, just taking those first few steps, right? It's just anything mm-hmm. that's so significantly challenging that um, it gets you to uh, reflect on your perspective of your life and what you're capable of. And I think that any moment that we can kind of find that in our life um, is very powerful and defining if we sort of listen. So 
going back yeah. to sort of what we suggested on you writing these down, I think that's such a beautiful practice because I think in the moment it can seem so profound and then so quickly as you're suggesting, we can just sort of go back into the daily grind of life yeah. and forget Absolutely. all these amazing moments of all that we experience that can really help us to sort of like show up and shine throughout our day. Yeah, absolutely. That makes me um, realize that I should, again, like at this stage in my life, a week before the book comes out, you know, I should <laughs> write my future self a letter because I can't mm -hmm. imagine there would ever, ever come a time where I'm like so shocked and thankful and amazed that someone's taken the time to read my book. And, you know, I hope that I never, ever lose that. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think I should do that again. It's, yeah, but yeah, it's such it's such a nice thing to be able to do. Yeah, well, I think it's just part of being human is that we adapt very quickly, and I yeah. think you know, I'm sure there's an Emma at some point in your life that couldn't even imagine writing a book and then all oh of a sudden God. she yeah. could imagine it and she was doing it and the process and the enduring process of doing it and now it's published and as you're suggesting people read it but maybe in a couple of years it's going to feel so normal and there's other things so we have to keep ourselves accountable to these really magical moments yeah. in our life. Exactly and yeah adaptability as I write in the book I write about that actually um, how we adapt so well and obviously in so yeah. many areas of our life it serves us incredibly well. But in, in right. other ways, it, it can make us, yeah, forget, you know, yeah. forget just how far we've come. So it goes both yeah. ways. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you went back to Switzerland, to this very spot uh, mm -hmm. that changed the trajectory of your life. What was that like, particularly standing at that spot? Yeah, that was so nice. So I went back, I think it was pretty much bang on five years later. And I went back to the field where I'd landed uh, in the skydive. And I just remember, like, I don't know, I thought I would feel overwhelming emotion and crying and whatever. And I just remember staying there and being like, wow, like life, wow. Right? you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it, and it's, I just had this profound sense of, you know, you can be in, you can be in one moment of your life and you think it's gonna mm -hmm. be forever. And then years down the track, you'll be in a totally different life and thinking like, how did I get from there to there? And so it's such a nice lesson to when, you know, the next time a hard moment arises to be like, there will be other days, there will be other moments beyond this one where I'm, you know, I think even if I went back there and I was still in a wheelchair, I hope I still would have had, had that same feeling of like, you know, life mm -hmm. was really hard and now, now life is good again, even regardless of how much I healed. So it was more about the, yeah, the emotion that I felt in in the spot but it, yeah it was really really nice to be able to do that it's such a beautiful lesson in knowing that our darkest moments that we get through are just they're more helpful when when they come up again knowing that we're able to get through them mm -hmm. um, but I, again I think it goes back to exactly what we're speaking to is you have to remind yourself how strong you were um, in those moments to get through them um, and that you got through them because I know that you speak in your book about sort of finding that inner strength and it kind of speaks to what you were talking about at the start of the conversation that Emma before this accident I assume wasn't fully sort of tapped into that sense of inner strength that I now sort of see in you yeah yeah mm -hmm. absolutely yeah she was not she <laughs> she was just getting going through the motions so yeah. yeah it's a really nice lesson for everyone to learn within themselves and obviously we don't you know we don't things to happen or we don't necessarily want them to but you always are I don't want to say better for it because some things are just absolutely you know effed with no reason or explanation but mm -hmm. we learn to I guess we learn to trust ourselves more that we're capable of handling whatever comes our way the more we do go through things it's yeah it's like a I think that's the word like a trust that you will be okay and you will return to you know um to yourself no matter what happens I love that you mentioned trust because that's something that more recently, probably in the last six months, I've really been practicing and leaning into and sort of mm -hmm. uh, experimenting with how it changes my life. And it really profoundly does that sense of trust, um, not only in yourself, but in life that things happen and there's always sort of a lesson to gain from. And I know it's extremely hard in the moment to lean into that, but there really is. And it kind of creates this sense of like, less resistance to life and more sort yeah. of allowing and opening yeah. and embracing and it's such a more beautiful way to live yeah absolutely I've noticed um 
since my accident, even even with like little things that aren't that, you know, that profound at all. But like, for example, when I was uh, renting a house with my friends and I absolutely loved it, I, ne- I never wanted to leave. I didn't want that stage of life to end. And then we got an email saying, you know, the owners are moving back in, you're going to have to leave. And we were all so upset and thinking, you know, we're never going to find somewhere we love this much. And just, and then just letting go of me like, okay, I trust that, you know, my, one of my favorite phrases is, if not this, then something better. Mm-hmm. So whenever something doesn't go my way and I think it's something that I've really wanted, I just trust that something better will fall in its place. And it always, like it absolutely always has. So yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, I guess, yeah, you just learn to trust the process more and trust that even if you can't see where something is going, just trust that it eventually will get there. Beautiful. And you speak to joy being based on one thing, which is a perspective. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us more about how we can have more joy in our life through having a joyful perspective? Yeah. Well, I guess it's not even necessarily a joyful, joyful perspective, but more just an appreciative and a grateful, grateful one. Like what we Mm -hmm. spoke about um, this whole time. It's like, you know, you can, you can think about all the things you've lost or you can think about all the things you still have or what you've gained or, you know, you can think about, as I say in the book, a lot of, when I meet people and they learn what happened to me, I notice they'll either say, either say one or two things and it, um, and I don't, you know, judge a person based on their response, but it tells me a lot about, I guess, their way of thinking. It will either be, um, you know, oh my gosh, you're so unlucky that that happened to you, you know, out of all the people that go skydiving, how unlucky that that happened to you. Or alternatively, like, oh my God, you're so lucky you survived. Like there's there's two ways that you can, yeah, yeah, there's two ways that you can look at that situation and it's, yeah, the exact same scenario. It's just taking a different um, approach to a different perspective of how you see it. So mm-hmm. I think having a, I was about to say an attitude of gratitude. How <laughs> um, it, I can see that being a book. <laughs> but it's so true. Like, just, um, you know, constantly thinking about um, or reminding yourself of what you're grateful for as yeah. opposed to just putting the focus on what you've lost. And obviously when things are really hard, like it's so fine to just be like, I'm really upset about this and that's totally fine. But, you know, when you when you have the strength to focus on what you still have and um, yeah, to shift the focus and perspective and that helps you naturally feel more joyful. That's a beautiful reflection, uh, certainly one that we can all take on because it's just so easy to focus on what we don't have or what we've mm-hmm. lost. And I think to begin to kind of use that as an anchor to become aware and really start focusing on what we have um, can be incredibly powerful. And I'm sure as you're aware, you know, being someone that sort of was full able-bodied to being a paraplegic in a wheelchair to sort of now being able to move again. Um, It's that idea of comparison, isn't it? And it's kind of like, I'm sure when you were in your wheelchair, it's like you just sort of want to walk. And now that you walk, maybe you want to walk faster or run fast, you know, whatever it may be. We got to catch ourselves in those moments, don't we? And just to be truly appreciative for what we have in this moment right now and stop focusing on what we don't have because no matter where we are in life, there'll always be something that we want that we don't have. Exactly. Absolutely. And it's like, yeah, one day there was a day where I would have given anything to be as, you know, as able-bodied and as, you know, have as much movement as I do today. Mm -hmm. I would have given anything, even to still be on crutches. And then, so, you know, it's so odd to now be like, oh, but I wish I could run. Yeah. Back then, that Emma wouldn't have cared. She just wanted to be able to, you know, be able to get up out of bed. So yeah. it's yeah, it's so important to not always be, I guess, what's the term? Like moving the goalpost, the goalpost right. without stopping yeah. to be thankful for reaching them in the first place. Um, yeah, and comparison. Like I used to find myself always wanting to, um, I guess, to prove to people that I used to be able to do that because I used to be yeah, so fit and active and could do all these sports. So whenever you know, I'd be struggling to do something at the gym. I'd, I'd wanted to, to tell someone like, oh, just so you know, like I used to be able to do this so good. But it's like, who cares? Like literally no one cares. And the, yeah, there's no point in comparing to anyone else or our past self. It's just like you in this moment do the best that you can do with what you've got. That's all that matters. Beautiful. I love it. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation, Emma. Oh, thank I you. highly recommend your beautiful book. I was saying before we press record, um, 
you have this beautiful finesse between sort of sharing raw and confronting moments, but with this sort of like poetic way of allowing the reader just to kind of flow with your journey and your reflection. So thank you thank for you so putting it together and sharing it with us. We can all learn a lot from it. Oh, thank you. I'm very excited. Very excited and very nervous. For people to read it. Yeah. <laughs> well, as we've, as we've covered in the conversation, just as long as you stay grateful throughout the process. True, very true. <laughs> and the <Yeah>. experience. <laughs> So on a final note, Emma, I'd love to ask you, what does it mean to you to be human? I think to me, that just means to experience anything I can. So Mm -hmm. the positive or negative, not that I think we even need to give things a positive or a negative, but just, you know, all of the joy, all of the sadness, everything, or like all of the random experiences that come into my life for example this year I got asked to walk at a fashion show which is something I'd never well <laughs> and, I, and I was like okay like I just I just want to have every life experience and feel all there is to feel and just mm. yeah dive in fully <laughs> beautiful yeah. thank you the fashion the fashion show is a bad example of that but you know, <laughs> just to experience